just want to emphasize to you that we're not just having these missionaries up here as uh, a, a cute display of people from another country or a third world country or like a plea for money, but, but really a rally cry for the body of believers to be on mission together, no matter where we sit, whether it be in this sanctuary or a sanctuary across the world. And so that's why, that's, that's the heart's desire behind this conversation, really. Um, a few weeks ago, Natalie and I were sitting in a, a, Cuban, a Cuban restaurant uh, on the other side of the river. I think it's called Na 1928. It's really good. You should check it out. Um, it's on, in, off of Bay Meadows. And Natalie and I were sitting there, and we're drinking our Cuban coffees and eating our sandwiches and, and listening to the music and notice this, this desire, this, this passion that we have for this type of culture. And then we started to daydream a little bit. We started to daydream and go, oh, you know, how cool would that be if we could start a, uh, a, a surf ranch in, a, in a, a farm in this little tiny town in, in some Spanish town across the, you know, wherever. And, and by the time we're, we're advanced in years, we can, we can hand it off to somebody else. How cool would that be? And that desire, we noticed that desire, and the first person we thought of were Lonnie and Debbie. Um, because this is what God's kind of birthed in your heart um, to, to do this as well and eventually hand it off. And um, so my first question, my, my first thought of is, is what, does, what does Abba's Pride actually do over in South Africa? Um, our vision is that every child will know the hope of Christ. And that's the core of everything you saw in the video. Mm -hmm. It's nice to feed and it's nice to have clothing. It's nice to grow and, and to disciple means to point them to Jesus. So our, our even bigger vision is that Abba's Pride will impact 5,000 children's lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're at about 750 now, yeah. plus their families. So um, God gives big dreams, dream it. Mm -hmm. You know, don't don't put them in a box. So that's you know that's what we do, um, and we do that in several different ways. We start with the early childhood. Um, my first experience was walking into a church, and it was concrete, and there were about fifty children sitting on the concrete, and there was a go go that was stand a grandmother that was there, granny type, and it was just sit down and be quiet. And I turned and walked away, and I was fussing at God. And I said, God, this is just not right. And the Lord quickly, whoop, whoop, and said, Debbie Warren, you leave your first world attitude at the door. You, I got a spanking. He said, you are here to help them take the next step, whatever that step is. So we began with ECD, um, early childhood. We have aftercare now as well. And Lonnie can tell you about the other parts. Well, we also um, do some building projects. Uh, we've been able to sink six wells the eight years we've been there, uh, which uh, in South Africa, it's very, very, very dry. And um, so the water not only gave them water for hygiene, drinking, cooking, but also for irrigation, for planting the vegetable gardens. We've got uh, three very, very good vegetable gardens growing that not only feed the children in the ECDs, in the church, the community, but they're able to make a little bit of profit to help uh, finance the, the programs they've got. Um, so uh, we're, uh, we're doing a, uh, we've built, uh, been able to build two schools and a library. The, the building you saw uh, going up, that was a library. And um, you saw me with a tape measure and I was teaching the pastors the Pythagorean theorem, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is how we're going to make a square. Three, four, five. It's amazing. It works every time. Well, the, the building we were attaching to wasn't that straight, so the building we built wasn't that straight. But anyway, it's it's up. The The roof doesn't leak. It's not going to fall down or hurt anybody. Amen. Uh, but <laughs> since then, we, we have started another big project, a foster village that consists of seven uh, single-family homes, um, that will house the orphaned and, and, and uh, vulnerable children there in that community 
through the church. Everything we do is through the, the rural church. We come alongside the pastor to allow him to lead his community, let the church be the church. And so uh, we do pastor's training. Um, Debbie does teaching. So, yeah. Uh, That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We, what we were talking about earlier was, um, and even earlier this week, was you work with the local, the local church. You don't just go in there and set up an orphanage and say, we, we have it all together, come, come to us. I love how you guys work with that local church. It was one of the things that our first conversations with them almost two years ago now was, was, that, was that the fact that you guys worked with the local churches. Um, go ahead. Yeah, no, we, we believe in that God has appointed an anointed head of that church. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're not that. You know, the anointed appointed person for this church is Pastor Nate. Mm-hmm. So um, we don't go into the community and say, you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to do this because it has to bubble up from within them. God has to give them the vision to take care of the orphan and vulnerable children mm-hmm. in their communities. Mm-hmm. And and wh- as they're doing that, then they are pointing people back to the church. Mm-hmm. And we don't live in that community, so it's it's that church that needs to be strong, and that that's how we how we see that. Um, one of our pastors, very first pastor, Pastor Silas, yeah, um, he he started taking care of children because he was walking through the community and saw a small child chewing on something that he, the child shouldn't have even had access to. And he was like, this is wrong. So they bring them in, and then they try to care for them. Mm-hmm. And so we just want to help them to do and to teach Jesus while they're doing yeah, it. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So. Ronnie even said, um, let the church be the church. Yeah. Let the church be the church in that community. So even in that community, in that context, the church is doing local missions. The mm-hmm. church is doing even national missions, going throughout South a- South Africa, on top of going throughout the world. Yeah, and I, I just love the, the fact that they're creating a sustainable ministry that they want for the people that are there to be able to, so if, to be able to carry on the ministry. So when Lonnie and Debbie um, come home, that the ministry doesn't stop. The ministry is not revolving around Lonnie and Debbie. It is revolving around the local pastors, and they're just there to um, to just be a help to the local pastors. Mm-hmm. And that and that's exactly um, you know what God's word um, says and would have us do. Because a lot of times as Americans, we um, just un- even unknowingly just kind of go into a place and think that we do things better, and really. Um, the pastors there, they know. They know what works for their community, and that's what we love about this ministry is that they um, are really um, pressing into those pastors and saying, no, what what does your community need? You know, coming to them from a point of, um, of wanting to learn, you know, and saying, like, what can we do to help you? Not, not this is what you need, and this is what we're here to do, mm-hmm. you know? So, and I just think that's a really beautiful and sustainable way to do missions. That's good. That's good. Um, to use a quote from Pastor Nate's sermon last last week, what what we do in here matters to them out there, and I think that's adding to adding to that point that we as a local body, we as a body of believers, can rally around the same idea within our own local context. That's good. Um, Matthew twenty eight is the the Great Commission. We see this as the Great Commission, and it's it's for all disciples of Christ. And it says, does say, uh, in starting in verse nineteen, it says, therefore, and go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So this is Jesus speaking. Teaching them everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And I love how he says, he doesn't just tell us to go and then leaves us hanging. He, he goes with us. <laughs> to even to the end of the age. Like, that's mind-boggling to me. And it reminds me of another passage of, uh, in Acts 1, 1, 8. Acts 1, 8 says, uh, going to uh, Jerusalem, Judea, 
Samaria and to the ends of the earth, in, uh, impacting all of those communities. And we've, we've, that's where we got that national, uh, local, national, and international mission. But as the students and I kind of noticed the other night, as we looked at the woman at the well, Jesus went from Judea and was going to Galilee, but made a stop in Samaria. Made a stop in Samaria and um, met this woman at the well. You might know the story. The interesting part is a bunch of Jewish believers don't go to Samaria because they don't like Samaritans. But he was intentional about going to Samaria for this woman specifically. But what I thought was even more interesting in regards to Acts 1-8 was they went somewhere they didn't like to go. Mm -hmm. they, they went somewhere that was like counter-cultural even. They went somewhere that was, that was even hard to go. They could have went straight to Galilee, but they didn't. They went to Samaria, and then a whole community was changed because of this one instance. Right. Um, this is, this is what exactly what Chris is talking about, is a lesson um, that I learned in my life a few years ago. I was able to be a part of a church plant in the Philippines for uh, six months, and then I came home, and um, you know, it was this time to uh, be back at home with my family, and, um, you know, I was living with my parents, and the, I needed a job, so I, I have an education major, so I, you know, put in my application for the counties around where I live. Um, my parents live on the west side of Jacksonville, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to put in an application in Duval, because I felt like, oh, it's just, you know, the school system is broken in Duval, and it's just too tough, you know, to work there, and I just, you know, I just don't really want to do that. It's uncomfortable, and so um, I remember I was driving in my car, and maybe you've heard this song. It says, you know, take me further than my feet could ever wander, and God really convicted my heart that I was willing to go to the Philippines and, you know, go out to the, the rice you know, the rice fields and sit with people in their, in their bamboo huts. And I was willing to live in Argentina and, you know, go to Guatemala and make a fool of myself playing soccer, but not willing to be a teacher in my own county mm -hmm. um, and in places that honestly were uncomfortable for me. Um, and so God really convicted my heart about, you know, maybe the where your feet should wander are, you know, right down the street mm -hmm. from where you grew up. Um, and so just that and that, honestly, for me, is just more uncomfortable than getting on a plane and, you know, living in a third world country and doing my laundry in a bucket. Um, and honestly, and that's what it is for for us. And that's what the Great Commission says as you're going. So what you're doing in your life, whatever you get up on Monday and do, that that's that's where your mission is. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would like to ask we we didn't do this last time, but I, I'd like to hear a little bit of the story, which we mentioned a little bit uh, in the first service. Um, but what was that transition like? How how did you hear that call or or know that it was South Africa specifically? Yeah, that's kind of a large, <laughs> large well, box to throw at you. You have two minutes. Yeah, you have two minutes. Go. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, our story starts as high school sweethearts and yeah. Next year, we celebrate 40 years of marriage. Yeah. Uh, thank you. He's a good man. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we grew up in the, in the same little country church uh, in, in Virginia Beach, Virginia, our hometown. And uh, we were married there. Uh, our oldest son was baptized there. And then uh, the church, about 21 years ago, uh, voted to do a church plant and we were part of that planting team that planted our home church now, Coastal Community Church in Virginia Beach. And Deb was on staff there. I was uh, just behind the scenes kind of guy, had a career with the city of Virginia Beach in their environmental uh, protection office. Um, but anyway, uh, 30 years of that. Um, during that time, we did several short-term mission trips. Um, we, uh, I went to South Africa a couple of times, Mozambique, uh, Jamaica, uh, Deb did. Um, I did Jamaica. You did Jamaica. I did Corsica. That's you did right. Corsica. Uh, yeah. How could I forget? Most beautiful place in the whole world, the island of Corsica. If you ever have a chance. But um, so during that time, the Lord 
uh, in 2006, started pulling us towards South Africa. In 2010, they did the so Soccer World Cup, and the church we're involved in there, our home church there, Eastside Community Church, they did a out massive outreach over the six-week period, and basically missionaries from all over the world joined them to go into the rural areas and do uh, what you'd call vacation Bible school. They call it trailer ministry. So you actually go into the community and live for a week doing uh, the vacation Bible school, teaching the stories, the songs, the dances, sports, and that kind of stuff. Um, up leading up to then, we felt like our time was coming. The Lord had prepared us to be on the mission field, and we were just falling in love with the country, the people, the children. And uh, Pastor Rian Neiman there uh, asked our pastor in Virginia Beach, because Debbie was on staff at the church, hey, we really would like these guys to come and help us begin a new work and follow up with uh, these churches that we've, we've had a week with. And so in 2012, eight years ago, we packed up everything we had in six suitcases and got on an airplane. Up until a month before we left, we didn't know where we were going to live mm -hmm. or what we were going to drive. Mm -hmm. But within a month, we already had our tickets because we had our visas. Within that last month, we were the, the Lord provided. That's awesome. And That's so great. eight years, and uh, the numbers you saw, um, I think it said 600. We're at 750 now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Six rural churches have great pastors. Um, originally you thought it was it, you thought it was china right well, right yeah. um i was <laughs> tell, tell that, that story, story. <laughs> 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 um, I, I thought of something else though um natalie when you said as you go my first experience in cross-cultural missions was jail ministry in my own community and that's where god told me i i could cross cultures mm. you know because that that's a whole different culture mm. and i i just fell in love with those ladies but anyway so in um 2001 we had an opportunity to go on a mission trip to south to china i had a friend from seminary who was um a, a missionary there and so three couples we decided hey this would be really cool um let's go into a closed country and tell people about jesus and so we smuggled <laughs> DVDs in and did all the things that missionaries Great. do. <laughs> um, but, you know, as we went, I saw my husband come alive on the mission field. I, I saw something in him that in 20 years of marriage I had never seen. He, he would just start talking to people the best he could. He had a fishing book. He loves to fish. Mm. If you want to know him, yeah. ask him to yeah. fish. Um, so he had a fishing book, and we were just sitting out. And because we were inside China, not just in Beijing, but in inside China, um, grandparents, people would bring their children by and point to us and say Americans. Mm. And so Lonnie started talking to people. He, he went home with people. Like, where'd you go? Oh, I went home with them. You don't know that person. But he went home with them. <laughs> On the way out... <laughs> <laughs> way past my comfort zone. On the way out, as we were as we were flying home, he was by the window, and I looked over, and he had tears in his eyes. And I was like, "Oh my word, I am married to a missionary." <laughs> <laughs> and the ramifications of that scared me, because yeah. I'm a homebody. So anyway, that was my missionary man, and w that's when the Lord was like. This is what I have for you. That was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me share just a, a quick story about China. Uh, I had the book, uh, Jimmy Houston, Professional Bass Fisherman, wrote a book, Hook for Life. It's, a, it's like a daily devotional, and it's got beautiful pictures of lakes and boats and fish and tackle, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I'm sitting down. A little 15-year-old boy comes up, no English, no Mandarin Chinese. And I start flipping through the books, and I'll say fish. Mm -hmm. I'll say boat, yeah. lake. And we flip through the whole book, right? He takes the book and flips it to one page and puts his finger down. Mm. The plan of salvation for God so loved the world. So. And can I say one more thing? One more thing. This is great. I love it. I love it. No, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is China. Okay, so this is, yeah, this is China. He gets up. He's going on this wild walk. So he goes into <laughs> the, 
it's like um, a more of a, a, a Muslim community area. And the vendors are all out. And so Lonnie's just prayer walking. He's just walking. And he sees this man called, we call him the Onion Man. And you want to tell the story? Because you can tell it quick. Okay, quick. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, so uh, we go into this community, and he's got a, a push wagon full of uh, spring onions. And he's going, he's got his route selected to the different uh, shops, the little restaurants. And I'm just wandering aimlessly. So we bump into each other. Uh, we just awkwardly communicate a little bit. And I've got this DVD. It's the, um, the Jesus story from Luke. English on one side, Mandarin, Chinese on the other. So walk away, and I just kick myself in the butt. I said, you know, Lonnie, you just passed up the opportunity to share the gospel with this Chinese guy. Walk along, believe it or not, within an hour, our paths crossed five times, mm. right? And still, I didn't. And then we were getting ready to leave. I had to look at my watch. It was time to get back to the hotel. These guys like sleeping late. And our paths cross again, and his wagon is empty. And he got a little bell, like on a bicycle, zing, 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 zing. And he waves to me. So I go over, and then I finally, you know, the Lord convicts me, this is the time. I give him the video and say, you know, this is my favorite story. It, it changed my life, right? So I go back and uh, tell these guys have what a great time I've had in the whole story. Well, the next day, Lonnie the Adventurer gets up and says, I'm going to go find that guy. Central China, 10 gazillion Chinese people, and I'm going to find this one guy, right? <laughs> so I walk in. Sure enough, there he is He's with his right wagon there. of onions, That's right? That's awesome. Walks up to me with tears in his eyes. Wow. And basically with hand gestures, he said he watched the video, he prayed, and he gave his life to Christ. That's crazy. How about Amen. That? That's good. That's good. That's so, good. So he, he actually wrote it in my journal and in Mandarin, had mm -hmm. to take it back and get it translated, that he was an unemployed teacher, and he was selling onions for a living to help his family. Mm -hmm. And they had, he, he had watched a video, and it changed his life. Yeah. So, I mean, let the, let the Lord work yeah. in any way. Yeah, yeah. And these are just, Sorry, th 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 no, this is fine. <laughs> this, these are just simple stories yeah. of something that the students and I learned again this week, <laughs> of, um, of just looking out for these simple opportunities. Uh, even if they come by five times, it's definitely something that you're, <laughs> you, you can see eventually. <laughs> <laughs> But like we're sitting in the, the the doctor's office and you just ask God, who do you want me to minister to today? Who do you want me to love? At least smile at. Who do, who do you who is around me that I can serve in this one moment? Um, and just being open open and willing to to look for those opportunities, whether it be called to a, a Title One school or to another country or to a dentist appointment. <laughs> As something as simple as that, um, and and just l allow God to, to move and to work, um, it's it's wonderful opportunity. So this is the global call. This is the the call that all believers have to go. Therefore, go wherever you are, whatever you do, go. Um, but but to get to the nitty gritty, the the specific details of of who, I guess, is a good question. And Abbas Pride does this uh, through the James 1, uh, 27 passage. It says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself polluted by the world. And this gives us, a, a, a give us, gives us a more specific people group, if you will. Um, you you want to say something about that? You want to say more about that? Um, yeah, uh, that, that verse does mean a lot to us as a team. It's not just Lonnie and I. We have 10 people there now that are part of the team that are, that are working. Um, because in that verse, there are a couple of things. One is it says true religion. Um, I think there are a lot of people that... Um, I call it fire insurance, perhaps, um, that don't understand that this is true religion, is to care for. It is an action. It's an action. You know, I could be a Christ follower and never open my mouth. Mm -hmm. And who have I, who have I pointed to Jesus? Mm -hmm. And one day we're going to give account for that. 
And it's also caring for the orphaned and the vulnerable and the widows. Those in, in the time of this writing were the marginalized. They, they were the least of the least of these. And so when we think about it in, in our contact, context, there are so many vulnerable and orphaned children in South Africa with uh, probably over 50% living below the poverty line of, of $1 a day. I mean, our children go to, go to bed hungry. And we have grandmothers that are caring for eight or ten of their grandchildren <laughs> in a shack and that don't know how they're going to feed those children. And th the systems there are broken. So we're just trying to be that gap mm -hmm. in there. But that, to us, is important, to be the hands and feet, and it, as Pastor Nate says, to be the boots on the ground, yeah. um, not just to sit back and say, oh, yeah, that's nice, but, or, oh, those poor kids, or, oh, you know, but to actually take action mm -hmm. and do something. And I think that's what James 127 challenges us to do. Yeah. Do you have a thought? Um, I didn't get your notes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful passage, and e even going in further into James, to be a doer of the word and not as hearer only. So these things that we read, these things that we study throughout our week, throughout our days of studying scripture, hearing what Pastor Nate is saying and diving into what he's saying, if we apply those things, it will birth out into action in, in, in our daily life from everywhere from the guy at the dentist's office to our family watching us. We, we talked about before, which I, I definitely want to mention, is that our children see what we do. Just like that little boy, you had an opportunity to talk to them. Yeah. These, these, your kids, your, your nephews, if you don't have any kids, your, your nieces, your, your grandkids, they get, to s they get to see you be on mission um, as you go, and they'll learn more from that than they do, than they do from a, a book. I don't know if that's a good way to say it, but y you know what I mean. They, they, lear they learn more by seeing you do it as their leaders. Yeah, and, and the way that that looks like in this context is um, Lonnie and Debbie, you know, they left their adult children to go to South Africa. And and what a, what a beautiful example that they've been of obedience, you know, because, um, you know, I, my, I live near my parents and I know I still call them and say, you know, mama, what do I do about this? Mm -hmm. um, and um, they left that and their kids still need them, even though they're adults. And they left that because they were being, you know, obedient to God's call. But that is a greater impact to their children than disobeying God and just, you know, telling them to read the Bible and go to church. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I just think that that's so beautiful, like what we can, the things that we can do, the people we can impact by, you know, obeying, obeying the call. And I'm not saying that you need to go to South Africa. Maybe you don't, but maybe you need to witness your neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, and your kids are going to see that, your kids or your grandkids or your, your other neighbors maybe. Um, and so I just, I just think that's really beautiful how they're, you know, they're still parenting their children even through being obedient to God's call in their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last week, Pastor Day um, gave us three instructions or directives to, to follow the, the pray uh, action steps. He says, he says, pray, pray for specific things, for specific people, listen to what the spirit is doing and be open to, to share. And I think our application is similar to that. Pray, listen. And I would even go to press in to say, like, be open to go, go down the street, across the street, to the car next to you, to, <laughs> to Ohio, to, uh, a lot of stuff going on in uh, the panhandle right now, as well as across the world, across the pond, if you will. Yeah. Um, but in Matthew 25, we see three separate parables. And these three separate parables give us a little bit more of directives of, um, of what to do or how to do it. Um, at least the heart intentions behind it. Do you want to talk more about that? Yeah, the, the first one is about the ten virgins and the bridegroom coming. And what he was talking about was us being the, the virgins waiting on Christ's second coming. Mm -hmm. And 
it, he goes on to say some of the maidens were ready. They had planned ahead, and they were expecting the Lord to come at any time or the bridegroom to come. Mm-hmm. And the others weren't quite so prepared. They were just walking along, you know, taking life as it goes, and they weren't prepared for the unknown moment when the bridegroom did, did appear. And so the challenge is, are you, are you preparing your hearts and your minds and your souls for that time that we mm-hmm. don't know exactly when it is? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Alice, when, we were, when you first mentioned those, that section to me, the first thing I noticed was like an urgency. They were they were eagerly eagerly preparing, um, eagerly waiting in expectation for that. Yeah, and I think that um, a, a really good example of expectant waiting um, that whenever you know there's to me there's two different types of waiting. Um, if you know when Chris and I were dating, if he would tell me you know I'm gonna come over and pick you up at six. If when he comes over, if I'm in my pajamas, you know, and I'm wa- in my bedroom watching Netflix, did I really think that he was going to come? You know, that shows that maybe, maybe I thought maybe he would come, but maybe I didn't really trust him. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, if I, you know, get ready, I, you know, put some clothes on to go out, I, you know, do my hair, my makeup, whatever, I, I'm expecting him to come. I'm waiting um, in expectation that he would be there. Mm-hmm. And um, because I know him and I trust him that he will come. So when we know and trust God, we will wait expectantly for what he is going to do. Um, You know, and the the only way to do that is to be in the word. Mm -hmm. The way that we can be expectant is to, you know, be pressing into him and get to know him so that we can trust him more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, the second parable uh, was, so you got the the ten maidens, ten virgins. And the second, I forgot what the second the talents. was. The talents, that's what the it talents. is. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, so, so, so the, uh, the story is the, the master gave uh, three of his servants a certain amount of, of gold to do with as they should be able to do with based on their talent because he was going away. And when he came back, uh, he expected a result. And so everyone in the room here and in the community, you know, the Lord has already given you a gift, a talent, whether it's teaching, whether it's accounting, whether it's building or even praying. Um, he's given you that talent and expects you to use it. And when the master came back, um, two of the three did exactly that. They, they used the talent that the Lord gave them and invested and, and made something of it. The third one, he didn't do so good. Mm-hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, there are some of us that aren't doing so good with the talents the Lord gave us. So the challenge is, you know, let's use what the Lord has given us, yeah, each and every one, yeah. whatever it may be, however it may be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to follow up on what, whatever it may be. Maybe your gift is smiling, mm-hmm. and you can stand at the door and make someone who's apprehensive to walk into the rock. When they see your smile and your warm welcome, their, their sense of stress goes, mm-hmm. So whether it's a one or five or ten, God gives as he desires to give. It's not up to us, but what is up to us is how we use what God has given us. Yeah, so, yeah, so being, a re- uh, being ready or, or having a sense of urgency. Uh, the second one being, being willing and um, preparing and even, even faithful to our gifts. Mm-hmm. The third one was talking about um, the, you were going to say it? Oh, no, the, the sheep and the goats, right? Yeah. And I, as many of you know, we have goats, and they're very, yeah, they're very annoying. But <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to be goats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but go ahead, and, go ahead and say that one. Okay, so um, in, in this parable, there, there are sheep and goats. And I want to say that in this room there are sheep and goats because we're all eating out of the same grass. When you, when you think about the sheep and the goats, right, You think that one's over here and one, no, they mingled around and and they were together. And so it is the day of judgment. And in Matthew 24, Jesus has been teaching, it's going to happen and you don't know when. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen and you don't know when. There will be judgment. You don't know when. Mm -hmm. And so then he goes on to being ready and having that urgency. And here they're called into account because when, when it's the day of judgment, some of us will be as sheep, and some of us will go to the right as sheep, and some will go to the left as goats. And 
And, and there's a difference there, and it has to do with what the, the sheep or the goat did in response to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because it says, he, if you read, when, Lord, did we see you hungry and not feed you or in jail and not visit you? You can, can read all of those things. And Jesus says, when you do for the least of these, you do for me. And he also said to, to the goats, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was, I was sick and you didn't visit me. And they said, well, when did we see you? Because I think if Jesus walked in that door right now, we'd all be, we'd be on it, wouldn't we? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's Jesus. We, we, got, we got to do our stuff. Um, but if, let's say somebody who is one of the least of these or the marginalized person in your community walks through that door. Will you be the hands and feet of Jesus to that community? And right now, Rock, you have an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus to children. You won't see the joy mm -hmm. when they get the gifts mm -hmm. or at the shelter when, when those go. So I think that for me that's, that's really important that we're going to give an account. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if I don't want to be uh, – we were talking to um, – to these guys and and for Halloween they or they, they had a, they invited their neighbors to come over and eat hamburgers mm. and they said we were the only ones eating hamburgers <laughs> nobody came and ate hamburgers with us and I was like you know but your friend your they watched mm. and one day you're going to stand and Jesus is going to look at you and say Chris and Natalie what do you did what yeah. did you do and you say well we tried to invite them over for hamburgers to <laughs> To, to build relationship, yeah. and he'll say, well done, yeah. my good and faithful servant. Yeah. You just yeah. do what you can do. Yeah, yeah, that's really, that's good. Her, her, her father, my father-in-law, is probably a prime example of that, Joel Miller's, of just constant faithfulness. He's impacted thousands and thousands of seventh graders. <laughs> he was a teacher at Trinity. Thousands of, 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 of seventh graders just by being faithful in what he did. Mm -hmm. so, so be ready, be able be, be willing to do these things and be faithful in doing it. So my challenge is similar to what Pastor Nate was talking about. Pray. Pray. We have an opportunity right, right here, right now, on those pamphlets with the Abbas Pride, we have an opportunity to be prayer partners with, uh, with this, this team. Mm -hmm. they, here, it looks like this. <laughs> it looks like this. You can tear it out in the back. And it has, uh, you can put your information on there. You can put those in the uh, offering box or drop it off at the cafe, and we can, we can collect those. Yeah, and, and what we'll do is if you give us your information, we will add you to our prayer list, mm -hmm. and we'll keep you updated on our prayer request as well as the, the pastor's request that we work with. And you'll be up to date. Um, and also, you know, you can follow us Facebook and all those kind of media things and see what's going on. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. You. It's not a bombardment of... of no, um, it's like every other month mm -hmm. or some once yeah. a month. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some people think that when they pray, it's, it's not a big deal. It's huge for us. Mm -hmm. We've been run off the road. We've been vandalized, almost mugged. Thing. I mean, that team, you don't send people into communities to push back darkness mm -hmm. and Satan stand there and mm -hmm. say, well, it's okay. So anytime you're pushing back darkness, you're going to come against. Mm -hmm. And that's where the prayers of the saints yeah. really do cover yeah. us, and that is so important. Yeah, the second application that Pastor Nate mentioned last week was listen. And obviously, like we've said, listen to that small voice when you're sitting at the doctor's office, when you have the same guy walk, walk by you five times. <laughs> if there's an opportunity to go, go. Listen to what God is saying. Um, and then be open to go. Be open to go across the street, sit out front on a Halloween, hoping that people will Feeling come Feeling pathetic. <laughs> people <laughs> hoping that people will eat hamburgers with you. <laughs> it hurts. I'll eat hamburgers Thank with you. you. Thank you. <laughs> that was good. Maybe we should have had tacos or something like that. Anyway, but be open to do those things. Uh, and I challenge your heart to be on mission with the believers around us to to see the gospel move throughout our city, throughout our county, throughout Florida, throughout our nation, and even overseas. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to, to have this type of conversation with what you're doing uh, around the world. Lord, I pray that we will heed the call and truly uh, be doers of your word and not hearers only. Heed the call. I pray that you, we would uh, be you would teach us to be doers of the word. That we would be a church that are people of your word. But not only readers of your word, but people in, in direct action in our community. Lord, show us opportunities to love our, our neighbors, our brothers and sisters, Show us opportunities to, to go. Show us opportunities in whatever means necessary, Lord. And teach us how to s send your word out into the world. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray so we can fight against the schemes of the enemy for people who desperately need it because their souls are at stake. Their souls are, are being bombarded, Lord, and I pray that you will teach us to pray, to rally around, to, to really be together as we see your gospel advance. Lord, teach us. Guide us. Lovingly lead us to, to do these things. not be stagnant in our comfy ways but really challenge ourselves to move be mobile Jesus we love you for what you've done in our hearts and in this church we thank you for what you're doing in the heart of this church and, and we praise you for what you're going to do when you return and in your name I pray Church, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did today. Awesome, awesome message. Lonnie, Debbie, thank you so much. Chris and Natalie, awesome job. Thank you so much. So I'm going to be reading from Hebrews 10, 5, 10. Uh, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I say, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered in according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will he, we be have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Would you stand as we sing our last song? Whoa. 
salvation and merciful giver of grace without end. Satisfied. Satisfied simply by being who you've always been. Infinite love. You are infinite love and you prove it again and again. together one voice. Father, you are enough for us. God, we thank you that we can trust you, your word. God, that your, your word is truly sufficient to follow. God, your promises are true. You don't break promises. The future sure. The price it has been paid. For Jesus Christ. God, a faithfulness to go to the places that you've called us to go and a desire to know you more and have others know you. God, we ask that you would bless Abba's pride and Debbie and Lonnie and their team. God, that you would protect them. God, that you would give them the strength to keep going. God, that you would make more disciples through them. We love you. God, help us to be missionaries as we go. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.